Okay, now, how do we arrange the implements in front of us? We begin with our left hand, right? Where is your left hand? So there you will place the kapala. Next to the kapala, you will place the bell. So after the kapala, you will place the bell. Now remember the bell I'm looking at the fan in this degree. Okay. Ah, now I can see. Okay. So first the kapala and then the bell. So with the bell, remember it has the face. The face should be looking at you. Okay, that's the correct direction. Then after that, you have the vajra. Remember that you have put a marking so that you know which is the top side of the vajra. So the top side of the Vajra should be pointing away from you. Then after that, you will have the Damaru, and then after that, you will have the Vaz. Oh. And now, uh, some advice on how to pick them up. Mm. So, um, okay, so how do you pick them up? So once you have arranged all these implements in front of you, with your right hand, the first thing that you pick up is the Vajra. And then, whilst holding the Vajra, you reach out again with the right hand and you pick up the bell. So you're holding both the Vajra and bell with your right hand. Then, you pass on the bell from your right hand to your left hand. So now you have the Vajra in the right hand and the bell in the left hand. Hand. If you need to pick up the Damaru, you pick it with your right hand. So you're holding the Vajra and then you can pick up the Damaru and you can play the Damaru. Okay, so as you can see, uh, if you're not familiar with all of this, it might get a little bit complicated. So you have to recite things, uh, you have to play the bell, you have to play the Damaru, you know, which hand am I using? and so forth. Geshe was saying, we used to have a Geshe in the monastery, and he was saying, oh, you know, um, when I'm playing the bell, I don't play the Damaru. When I play the Damaru, I cannot play the bell. If I'm playing both Damaru and bell, I don't know what am I reciting. So it becomes complicated. <laughs> um, it takes a bit of practice to be coordinated with all of this. So now when you finish and you want to place them back on the table, basically you reverse the order. The first thing that has to go on the table is the Damaru, because that was the last one that you picked up. And when you put, put down the Damaru, put it down neatly. So the Damaru has all this brocade, like a tail. So it's very good to, to kind of like fold the brocade. And then you have to put the Damaru down. So remember, although the tendency is to put it flat on the table, because you don't know which one is the male and which one is the female side, you might be making a mistake. So put it on the side to avoid the mistake. So first place the Damaru. The next one is the bell. Now, the bell is on your left hand. Do not put it there on your left hand. But from the left hand, pass it to your right hand. And then with your right hand, place it on the table. And then the last thing you're left with is the Vajra. So just place then the Vajra with the tip, you know, the top tip away from you, put it on the table. Otherwise, if you just directly take the, you're holding the bell on your left hand and you just directly, you know, put it down with the left hand is not appropriate and this is not the tradition and it's a mistake. So from the left hand, you have to pass it to the right hand and the right hand will put it down. Okay, so we say that the proper way is to always first pick the bell with your right hand and then from the right hand you pass it to the left. There is one exception. When, for example, we do self-initiation and we want to bless the Vajra and bell. So when you do the blessing of the Vajra and bell, you're holding the Vajra and then you say Om Vajra Gandhi Hum 
And at that point, you can pick, you pick up the Vajra directly with your left hand. Right? This is the one and only exception. This is when you're blessing the Vajra and the bell. And then you can put it down uh, directly with the left hand. That's the only exception. So otherwise, as we say, the proper way to do it is always to pass, you pick it up with the right hand and pass it on, on the, to the left hand. And when you finish using it, from the left hand, you put it to the right hand, and the right hand is going to put it down. So the order of replacing all these instruments on your table is, first of all, the Damaru. The Damaru has all those, the brocade hanging from it. So you don't want it to get tangled. So put it down in a neatly folded way, and then make sure that the Damaru is on the side. It's not with a flat. It's not with a flat surface on the, on the table. Put it on the side. Then pass the bell from the left hand to the right hand. And the right hand is going to place it on the table. When you place it on the table, you have to make sure that the face is looking towards you, is not looking towards another direction. So have a look, and if you need to adjust it, turn it around, turn it around so that the face is looking you. Then the last thing that you put down is the Vajra, and you put down the Vajra with the marked tip, which is the, the, the head or the upper part facing away from you. Remember, when you're playing the Vajra and the bell, you don't do it up in the air, right? So this is like, I don't know, this is some like folklore dancing or something. Yeah? Don't do it like this. We, we explain the Damaru, you have to play it low, hold it and play it lower in your body. It should be at the, at the level of your navel. And as for the bell, you, play, you hold it higher, more or less at the level of the heart. Okay? So the bell at the heart and the Damaru a bit lower in the body. Mm. So, you know, this uh, guess what I just demonstrated the two implements, the Vajra or the Dorje and the bell. And um, uh, I guess I made the comment that, you know, sometimes we're just holding those implements and we're ringing the bell and so forth. But if you're using those implements without having a recognition of their actual meaning, then it is not very beneficial. Also, it is not very respectful to just be ringing a bell, you know, using this implement. And therefore, Gesheva um, decided to explain a bit of the symbolism, because these are symbolic implements. So uh, hopefully you will understand more of their meaning. And next time you will hear the terms Vajra and Bell, or next time you will see a Vajra and Bell, you will appreciate it more. You will, it will become more precious for you once you understand the meaning behind this. Okay, so, you know, as we say, they are relevant in the tantric practice and there is a particular order when we do our practice, after we do the self-generation, what we have to do is establish and then bless those implements. So, first of all, when we're looking at the Vajra, the Dorje, uh, from among method and wisdom, it symbolizes method. And as for the bell, it symbolizes wisdom. It's the wisdom of emptiness. So when you're ringing the bell, the bell is actually proclaiming the sound or the meaning of emptiness. Okay, so we have already said that one level of symbolism is that the Vajra is the method and the bell is the wisdom. However, on another level, we can say that the Vajra represents Vajradhara and the bell symbolizes his concert, a female concert, concert which is Vajradhatu Ishvari. And this is why you can see in the bell there is a face. So the face is the, the face of the female deity, the female concert. So when you have the Vajra and the bell, you have the pair of the male and the female deity. Okay, so when we're looking at the Vajra and we see how it is constructed, you can see that it has a number of spokes. So in this case, we are dealing with a five-spoke Vajra because it has four spokes in the four directions and then it has one central spoke in the middle. So altogether, it has five. Those five spokes symbolize the five Buddha lineages. According to the Goya Samaja system, the central spoke is Buddha Akshobhya. 
So according to other systems, at the center you might have another Buddha, but in Guya Samaja, and in this case here, in the five-spoke Vajra, the central one, the one in the center, symbolizes Buddha Akshobhya. Okay, so uh, you can see that Gessler has actually tied uh, a small, like a white cord, right? Uh, and uh, usually when we put that, it's because we want to differentiate the sides. So we want to delineate which side is closer to our body, right? So from those four spokes, one of them is closer to us. And that side is considered to be the east direction. So in the east direction, we have Buddha Vairochana. And then moving clockwise from there, the next direction, which is going to be the south, will be Buddha Radnasabhava. Then the next direction, which is going to be in front of you, away from you, in front of you, will be uh, Buddha Amitabha. And then the next direction will be Buddha Amogasiddhi. So this is how we, again, according to the Guya Samaja and moving clockwise, this is how we place the five Buddhas. Okay, so this particular interpretation that we followed today follows the presentation of Kedru Rinpoche in his text, uh, the, uh, the, the Festival of Tantra. And in that, we, as we say, we follow the Guya Samaja system. And according to this explanation, the central spoke is the spoke of Akshobhya, and then the, the remaining four Buddhas are placed in the order that we have mentioned. In other texts, you can find different explanations. And in other texts, you might find mentioned that the central spoke is Vairochana instead of being Akshobhya. So obviously, everyone would have to be rearranged in another presentation. So if we look at uh, different texts, uh, in, a particu in particular, Sambuddha Tantra. Sambuddha Tantra gives a different explanation. And it says that at the central spoke, we have Vairochana, and at the east spoke, we have Akshobhya. So according to Sambuddha Tantra, the location of those two Buddhas is reversed. So according to Guya Samaja, you have Akshobhya at the center and Vairochana at the east. But according to Sambuddha Tantra, you have Vairochana at the center and Akshobhya to the east. Now, since we say we follow, you know, we are we follow the Giluk tradition here, and uh, we want to go with the interpretation or the presentation according to the Guya Samaja Tantra. And the thing is that Guya Samaja Tantra is universally accepted uh, by all the different schools. So, so the Sakya, the Nima, the Geluk, everyone accepts Guya, Guya Samaja. Okay, so if uh, you have a Vajra and Bell with you today, it will be very good if you pick up the Vajra in your hand and you can actually follow the presentation. So those of you who have your Vajras, please hold them in your hand. Okay, now below the spokes, you will see that there is um, an area that actually represents a lotus, and that lotus has eight petals. So if you look closely, you will see the eight petals of the lotus below the spokes. And those eight petals represent the eight closed disciples. So in terms of the bodhisattvas, we have the eight bodhisattvas who are the close disciples, such as Manjushri, Chenresik, and so forth. Right. Okay, so as we say, we have eight petals, and the eight petals represent the eight uh, bodhisattvas that are the close disciples. So when you look at those eight petals, you have to see them as the seed upon which those, uh, those eight bodhisattvas uh, reside. Okay, so how are we going to place them? Uh, to the east, we have Madriya. To the southeast, we have um, Shidigarbha. To the south, we have Vajrapani. To the southwest, we have Akasha Garbha. To the west, we have Chenrezig. To the northwest, 
we have Manjushri. To the north, we have uh, Dripsel, and which is um, um, Sarva, Sarva Nirvana Viscambini. And to the northeast, we have uh, Samanda Bhadra. Okay, so as, we, as you can see, Geshe-la has actually tied a little white uh, knot string uh, at one side of the Vajra. And the reason for that is because in the Vajra, we actually have top and bottom. And we should always be clear about what is the top side of the Vajra. So you tie a knot or you make a mark at, the, at one side and then you know that this symbolizes the top. This is quite important because as we handle the Vajra, um, for example, we have to point the top of the Vajra in a particular direction when you're doing a mudra and so forth. And if you point the bottom, there is a fault. So to avoid making that mistake and accumulating the fault, we always mark and we know, okay, when you pick up your Vajra, you know which is the top and which is the bottom. But then you notice also that the bell has a similar little marking at the top. And obviously, it's not because you want to differentiate in the case of the bell, what is the top and what is the bottom. That is pretty obvious. But... Um, Geshe-la says, you know, my, my thinking, and you, you see that a lot, my thinking is that because, uh, let's say, you might have a lot of Vajras and Mel present in one room, if, your, if you have marked your Vajra and your Bell, then you will know straight away that these two are a pair, this Vajra and this Bell, this bell they go together because they have the same type of knot or marking at the top. Okay, so also in that area, you might be able to see in your Vajra that you have some markings that resemble rays of light, so some lines going out. Uh, depending on the craftsmanship of your, of your Vajra, you might be able to see it. So in some Vajras, it is clearly marked. In some Vajras, it does not appear very clearly. Anyway, the, these lines are supposed to represent rays of light and those rays of light represent the enlightened activities of the Buddhas because the enlightened activities of the Buddhas they always radiate they're always issued out they go out like rays of light and they pervade every sentient being and we are the recipients so we receive all these blessings of the enlightened activities of the Buddhas so Geshe was saying, you know, have a look. You might be able to see them. Sometimes the people, you know, who make the Vajras perhaps are not very well aware that this is a, a significant point and, and perhaps they don't pay attention to the detail. Or sometimes it is there and then we pick up the Vajra, but we don't pay attention because we don't understand the symbolism. So hopefully it is apparent in your Vajra and you can see. So those lines indicate, ray, they represent rays of light that are there to indicate the enlightened activities of the Buddha. They pervade everywhere and we receive these activities. Okay, now look at the base of the spokes, the side spokes. You will see that it's a bit more uh, rounded, fleshy there. If you hold it vertical, you won't be able to actually see what it is. So, um, if you hold it horizontally, you won't see it. Put it vertical, put it like this, and have a good look at the side of the spokes. What you have there at the base of the spokes is the head of a sea monster, like a crocodile. So, actually, that sea monster has its mouth open, and the spokes are coming out of its mouth. So in reality, that sea monster is holding, is grasping with its mouth those spokes. So what is the symbolism behind all that? The symbolism is that the compassion of the Buddha is always holding sentient beings, will never let them go. So just as the sea monster is holding on into the spokes of the Vajra, 
and will not release the spokes of the Vajra. Similarly, the Buddha will never let go of sentient beings out of the force of his compassion. So he's holding, he's retaining, gra not grasping, but holding sentient beings. Okay, so we have explained the five spokes at the top part of the Vajra, but then you can see that you have five such spokes at the bottom of the Vajra. So in the bottom part of the Vajra, the five spokes represent the five Dakinis. Now, it will be good to look at them, but as we say, there is negativity to hold the Vajra upside down. So don't turn your Vajra upside down, just turn your Vajra to the side and look at those spokes. So at the very center, we have Yeshe Kandroma, okay? The Yeshe Dakini. Then to the east, which is again, you know, if you follow the marking at the top, you will know which side is the east. So to the east, you have the Dorje Dakini or the Vajra Dakini. To the north, you have the Rafu Dakini. To the west, you have Vajra Vitali. And to the south, you have two more. Okay, then. Um, after or you know above actually because we're talking at the bottom above the spokes what you can see you have eight petals again so the buzzer is completely symmetrical what you have at the top you will have at the bottom as well so um above the lower five spokes you have eight petals in those eight petals you have eight goddesses um, if it is all right, I will send you the names because I don't have all the names in English or all the names, some, some in English, some Tagesla Jela Koranzo, the Klamuge Koranzo, Sente Sopatana, etc. Lare, Lare, Okay. okay. Um, all right, so I will send you the list, the full list of the eight goddesses. So at the bottom, you have the five Dakinis, then you have the eight goddesses. And then the symbolism of the other parts is exactly the same as the things that we had at the top. Now, look at the very center of your Vajra. At the very center of the Vajra, you almost, you have what is called like the, um, yeah, no, the central part of the Vajra. And we said before that the Vajra also signifies Vajradhara. So at this very central part, which is almost like a sphere, like a bowl, that part there sim sig um, exemplifies Vajradhara. And you can see that all the spokes and everything else from the top and the bottom, it's as if it grows out of that central point of the Vajra. And this actually indicates that Buddha Vajradhara is the origin from where everything else manifests. So everything else is a manifestation. Everything spreads out from that central point. Other people say that this uh, center, central point actually represents the five Buddha lineages. But we have to understand that Buddha Vajradhara is the origin and that those five Buddha lineages, they manifest or they develop out of Buddha Vajradhara. Okay, now at that uh, central part, you might be able to uh, see some further details. So in some Vajras, they are there, in some Vajras, they are missing. They should be there. And it's almost like there are three spirals or three areas. And these three spirals represent the Buddha's body, the speech, and the mind. Sometimes the people who make the Vajras, they don't know all the details and all the symbolism, and they might omit it. So I guess I was saying in his Vajra, um, you can kind of see it. You can more or less guess that it is there. So maybe your, in your Vajra is more clear.
Um, there is another interpretation of those three, it's almost like three bands in the center, right? So instead of saying that they symbolize body, speech, and mind, some people say that they symbolize the three bodies of the Buddha. So the Dharma body, the enjoyment body, and the emanation body. Geshe says, I find this more agreeable. I find this a better presentation. Okay, so as you can see, at the upper part of the Vajra, we have all the male deities, and at the lower part of the Vajra, we have the female deities. If you pay attention, you will see that uh, at the very base of the spokes, the spokes have to be attached somewhere. So basically, we have a flat and round area, almost like a coin, right? Um, which is the where all the spokes land there and are attached. You, you will be able to see it if you're holding your Vajra in front of your nose, in, in vertical in front of you, okay? So you will notice there is a flat area on, on which the spokes are attached to. So this represents the base or the seat of all those deities. So it actually represents a moon seat. So now the question arises, it's like, okay, so are we supposed to visualize the moon seed as like a planet, the planet is round, or are we supposed to visualize it flat, almost like a coin, right? And the answer to that is that if you look out in the sky, the way that we perceive the, the moon is like, almost like a flat, round surface. And this is what we symbolize here. It's a flat, round surface, it's the moon seed, it is the seat and the base of the deities. And usually when we have a, a seat that is made out of the lotus, the sun, and the moon, when we stack up the seat, the way that we usually depict that is like coins, right? So like you stacking up coins. So you can visualize it like this. And it is reflected here in the, in the, in the shape of the Vajra. Yeah. Mm. All right, now in terms of classification, classification is like how many types of Vajras are there. In terms of the numbers of the spoke, they say you can have anything from one spoke to a thousand spoke Vajras. I guess I was saying, actually, this is what is written in the text, but I guess I says I have not seen one spoke Vajra <laughs> or a two spoke Vajra. Uh, the common Vajra that we see is the five-spoke Vajra. So Geshe was just counting the spokes. If you count the spokes, you have four on the side and one in the middle, making five. Mm. Okay, so, Okay, so um, as we say, as you can see, we have many classifications of different Vajras. And actually, each one of those Vajras, the one spoke, the two spoke, the three spoke, and so forth, each one of them has a particular function. So it is used for a particular purpose. Geshe says, I don't know all the purpose of all the Vajras, but I know that the one spoke Vajra seems to be used for the sake of um, you can say subduing or eliminating nagas when it is necessary. For the three-spoke Vajra, it seems that it has the function of um, gaining control over others. So you, it brings others under your control. If this is the type of activity that you want to perform, you need to use a three-spoke Vajra. So again, Geshe says, you know, there are many functions, uh, many specific properties, but Yes, I says, I don't know all of those things, so I will not elaborate further. Now, there is another mention of the one-spoke Vajra. They say that in the Yamantaka Tantra, Yamantaka has uh, a spear or a lance, and usually the spear is quite long. But in the case of Yamantaka, this spear is very short. So that very short spear is said to be a one-spoke Vajra. This is how it is described. So Geshe says, again, I'm not, I'm not an expert on this, I'm not sure. There is another type of Vajra that is called the Raffle Vajra. Now, in the Vajra that you have, you can see that the four spokes actually all come together and they close and they meet with the central spoke. In the case of the Russell Vajra, the four spokes are not closed, they are open, right? 
So sometimes they say they're like almost like the thorns of a, of a plant or a part of a plant that has opened up. So it's a different configuration. It's open rather than closed. Okay, there's another Vajra that Geshla is showing you, and this is the must be the nine-spoke Vajra. It has eight spokes around and one spoke at the center, so altogether nine. There are others who say that the nine-spoke Vajra is actually no different from the five-spoke Vajra. And the way that it becomes the nine spoke is that you have four side spokes at the top, four side spokes at the bottom, making eight, and then you just count one central spoke, common central spoke, right? So that will become nine. So they say the nine spoke is just the five spoke. There are some who say, actually, this is not the five-spoke Vajra, because you have five spokes at the top and five spokes at the bottom. So this is a ten-spoke Vajra. Okay? All right. So we're left with the question, what are we going to call this? The ten-spoke Vajra, the nine-spoke Vajra, the five-spoke Vajra? Which one is it? Okay, there are, there are many who argue that actually this Vajra is the five-spoke Vajra. It doesn't matter if altogether there are ten or nine spokes, this is the five-spoke Vajra. And they say it is similar to the seven-leaf tree. So it's a particular tree in which the leaves come in clusters. So the leaves come in clusters of seven. Obviously, if you look at the whole tree, you're going to have many leaves. It's not just that it has, it has just seven leaves. It has many leaves, but they come in clusters, in groups of seven. Seven, 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 seven. So this tree is called the seven-leaf tree. So like this, this is the five-spoke Vajra. <laughs> All right, Gesha says, I decide I'm calling this, declaring this, the five-spoke Vajra. <laughs> and the nine-spoke Vajra. <laughs> that, that's the nine-spoke Vajra. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we, we make them different. Okay. So now you have come to see the symbolism in the Vajra. You can see what a precious object it is. So the Vajra is not something that um, you should disrespect, it's not something to use um, playfully as a toy and so forth, it's not something that you would put on the floor or that you would casually throw here and there. The Vajra, as you can see, uh, is the place that symbolizes all of those deities, male and female. Basically, it symbolizes the entire mandala. When we talk about the practice of Tantra, we talk about the practice of generation and completion stage. In the generation stage, the main practice is the practice of visualizing all the deities in the mandala and visualizing the inestimable mansion, the palace of the deity. And all of this is represented in the Vajra. So you can see the Vajra is actually very precious, very important. So it is fitting that we treat it with respect. Okay, so we've said that the bell symbolizes the concert of um, Vajradhara, so she's Vajradhatu Ishvari. Uh, another way of referring to the bell is that she, it symbolizes the wisdom lady, or the wisdom female deity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, at the upper part um, of the bell, you will see that there are letters. And there you can see this, the letter of the syllable LAM. Sometimes it is uh, written in Sanskrit, sometimes it is written in Tibetan. In Geshe's case, it is written in Tibetan, so he can definitely say, I can see LAM there. Okay, so we say that we have the syllable LAM there. And the Lam symbolizes the goddess Lochana. Lochana is her Sanskrit name. So why do we end up with the syllable Lam? 
Her name is Luciana. So the first letter of her name is the letter L, isn't it? And this you would write as La. But then since we're dealing with Tantra, it becomes Lam. And the M sound comes because above the syllable La, we draw a little circle. The circle symbolizes emptiness. Now, in reality, it's not just a circle. Above the root letter, which is the syllable la, we draw the half moon, and on top of the half moon, we draw the circle. The half moon symbolizes bliss, and the circle symbolizes emptiness, because we want to indicate that whatever deity you have or whatever phenomenon you have within Tantra uh, is a manifestation of bliss and emptiness. So, Lam to symbolize Luchana, who comes from bliss and emptiness. So, we said that the circle symbolizes emptiness in Sanskrit Shunyata, and this comes to the fact that, you know, when we talk about something which is empty, there is nothing there, so it's a zero. So, just as in the West, we symbolize that nothing with the zero, um, in Sanskrit, the sunyata, emptiness, is symbolized by this circle. Okay, uh, we continue clockwise to the next petal. After the syllable bam, lam, sorry, after lam, you will see the syllable bam. Okay, so it is ba and it has a little circle on the top that makes it bam. So this symbolizes the goddess Basudari. So, Ba for Basudari, uh, which in Tibetan is Noryuma, which means the one who gives wealth and jewels and wealth, like that. To the petal in the south, we have the syllable Mam. So, we're looking at some goddess whose name begins with M, and that is Mamaki. Okay, then uh, to the southwest we find the syllable Zum. So we're looking for someone whose name begins with Zum, and this is the goddess Zunda. Zunda is the Sanskrit. In the Tibetan, she is Kunsenma. Okay, so in the west we have the syllable Pam. Uh, the syllable PAM uh, stands for Pandaravasin or Pandaravasina, that's the name of the goddess. In Tibetan, her name is Gokarmo, meaning, meaning the goddess that is dressed in white. Um, and um, um, yeah, the, the PAM, the PAM, the syllable PAM symbolizes um, uh, Dikpa, like negativity, so the Pandara is the, the part of the name that talks about negativity. Mm. Okay, in the West we have the syllable Bri, and Bri is the beginning of the name of Bri Puti. Brikuti is uh, the um, uh, Sanskrit name for the goddess Tronyer Jenma, which means the frowning, frowning goddess. To the north, we have the syllable Tam. So we're looking with someone whose name begins with Ta, and this is Tara. So Droma, Tara. Uh, northwest, we have the syllable Mam. And the syllable mam indicates the beginning of the name of Malini. Malini uh, comes from the word mala, which means garland, right? So we have the goddess of garlands there. So in uh, that area of the bell where we have the eight lotuses, you can see that we have uh, the syllables indicating the first letter of those eight goddesses. So, those eight petals symbolize the eight concerts, such as Mamaki and so forth, or you can say the eight goddesses. Okay, now above those petals, um, as we go towards the stem of the bell, um, there is actually a vase. 
It might be clear in your bell or not so clear. But what is there is a vase. That vase is supposed to be filled with nectar and it represents great bliss. So remember, we have bliss and emptiness. So this is the element of bliss here. Okay, so you can see different bells. Uh, one bell is missing the vase. It has a hole, a gaping, a gaping hole there. The other uh, bell had a vase. Okay, so in that second uh, bell, you cannot see the actual shape of uh, the vase. However, this circle represents the belly of the vase. In the other bell, you could see, you know, the bottom, the bell, the belly of the vase, you know, the top, the mouth of the vase, and so forth. Okay, now, different types of bell. In terms of the bell, we have the outer or the external and the inner or internal bell. Now, you can see in this particular bell, the spokes that we have at the top, they are not coming out of the mouth of uh, a crocodile or a water mo monster. Uh, so they're called, you know, you just see the spokes. So they're just called the external, the outer ones. And also the vase is called the external. The remaining uh, parts are considered to be the inner uh, bell. So this uh, terminology, the outer and the inner bell, describing different parts of the bell, it's an old terminology. So the previous Tibetans, so previous here refers to generations that were previous, before Lama Tsongkhapa, they were using this terminology, and this is what we explain. You know, it's an old type of terminology. Okay, so uh, if you look below the petals, there is a design that goes around the bell, and in that design, you have the head of a monster again, a water monster, and from his mouth come garlands and drops. Now, a garland is a whole garland, so you can see the whole loop. And a drop is half a garland, which is the one that is dropping down. It's half, it's not attached to the next mouth, right? It's, it's pointing downwards. And in there, between the garlands and the drops, in the drops, you can see that you have vajras. If you have vajras, as attached to them, this bell is going to be the bell of Vajra Sattva or the bell of Vajra Dara because you have Vajras. Okay, so um, if you look at this design, definitely you will see the face of that creature. And from the mouth of that creature, so you have one and then you have another one. So from mouth to mouth, there is a garland, something that goes all the way from the mouth of, from one mouth to the next mouth. This is a garland, right? A whole loop. Then you have something which is half a garland. Because it's half a garland, it will not stretch all the way there. So it's hanging from the mouth downwards. Okay? So you have the garlands and the drops. The drops they drop down. Okay. And, and there, in between, you will see decorations. If all of those decorations are Vajras, then you are talking about Vajra Sattva or Vajra Dara Bell. Okay, in other bells, you don't see only Vajras, but what you see is alternating symbols. So you might see a wheel, and then the next one will have a lotus, and then the next one will have a sword, and so forth. So these are actually the emblems of the five Buddha lineages. So in that case, this is called the bell of the five lineages. So the five Buddha, the five Buddhas, or the five Buddha lineages, are, are also called the five Tathagatas. The Buddhas are called Tathagatas. So sometimes we refer to this type of bell as the five Tathagata bell. Yeah. If the only design that you see amongst the garlands is wheel, so it's all wheels, 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 uh, wheels represent Vairochana. So this will be called the Vairochana bell. Yeah. 
if the only design that you see amongst you know the garlands um, is a jewel the jewel represents Radna Sambhava. So this is going to be a Radna Sambhava. Yeah. Yeah. If you can only see lotuses, this will be an Amitabha bell. And if you can only see swords, it means that this is Amogasiddhi bell. So Geshe is looking at my bell. I can tell you that it is the five Satagata bell. So have a look at your own bell and see what type of bell you have. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, uh, if you turn your bell upside down and look what is inside the cavity, um, I, again, you will see a variation. Uh, in some bells, they write Omahum. In some bells, it has symbols of um, lotuses. In other bells, it has symbols of Vajras and so forth. However, Kedru Rinpoche has said that really what you need to have there is the reality source. Okay, so uh, those of you who know a little bit about Tantra will, will recognize the term and the symbol for the reality source. The symbol is a triangle, right? So you should have a triangle. And the term in Tibetan um, indicates that it is the source for all phenomena. And because, you know, if when you establish the mandala of the deity and the inestimable mansion, everything comes out of the reality source. So it is the source, it is the origin of all those things. Uh, in some cases, we have double reality source. So the double reality source is two triangles. Um, one is pointing one way and the other triangle is facing the other way. So you end up with a shape that resembles a star, the shape of a star. However, Keturu indicates that in this case, it should be a single reality. So just a triangle, that's what it should be there. <laughs> okay, so as I say, in some bells you might see Omahum written on the inside. Geshe says, my interpretation, it doesn't say so in the text. My idea is that, you know, when you look at the bell, again, it symbolizes so many deities. You have so many de deities. And when you write Omahum there, it is, you symbolize the speech of all those deities. Anyway, Geshe says, don't quote me on this. Just, just my idea. <laughs> All right, so if you look at the bell, you will see that the upper part of the bell actually is half a Vajra, isn't it? And it is, remember that the bell symbolizes wisdom, it symbolizes the consort of Vajradhara, so the bell is, the bell is Vajradhara Ishvari. But the other part is half a Vajra, which symbolizes method. And this actually shows that we have this complete union of method and wisdom, that um, everything, you know, this union of the male and the female, which is very important in Tantra. This, uh, all this presentation is presentation according to the generation stage. So there is uh, even more presentation and explanation that can be given according to the completion stage. However, it would not be appropriate to go into those details because there are quite a lot of people here who have not received full initiation. And Geshe says, even myself, I do not know all the symbolism according to the completion stage. In any way, because we have a mixed audience, it is inappropriate to go into more details about the symbolism of the completion stage. But you can see, you know, with the Vajra and Bell, when you have the pair together, the Vajra and Bell, definitely you have the method and wisdom. But remember, the main thing in the generation stage is that you establish the mandala with all the deities. So when you're holding the Vajra and the Bell, you must have recollection of all those deities that are present there in the mandala. So with this recollection, we, you pick up the Vajra and you circle with the Vajra. The way that you circle with the Vajra, um, it's either done with the Vajra vertical, you circle vertically, or you put the Vajra horizontally and you circle like this. And after you have done this, you ring the bell. So when you ring the bell, as you say, you proclaim the sound of emptiness, and you have to imagine that you do this in the 
eight directions. It doesn't mean that you have to keep ringing your bell, you know, this direction, that direction, and that direction. You, ima you just ring it here, but you imagine that you're ringing or proclaiming the sound of emptiness in every direction. Okay, so, so far, uh, we have looked at the different parts of the Vajra and the bell and the symbolism of those parts. So, Nagesula says, I still would like to explain how do you pick them up, uh, how do you handle them, how do you use them. All right, so um, we had a presentation today of how to um, set out all those implements, uh, what they symbolize, how to pick them up, and how to play them. But this is just an initial explanation. Actually, you will find that when you go home and try to pick them up and play them, you will be confused. There, uh, if you try to do it now, you won't be able to do it. And the reason for that is lack of experience. So what you need to do now that it has been explained to you, and hopefully you understand these points, you go back home and practice. You go back home and you set them out, and you say, okay, how do I begin? How do I pick them up? How do I play them? It takes a bit of practice to actually get the Dhamma going and the bell going at the same time, right? So you just go home and practice, practice, practice those things. Okay, so um, so later on you will be able to handle all the implements. Another thing that we should have a class is the mudras, how to do the mudras. So, you know, when we say argam, padiam, and so forth, we always accompany this with certain hand gestures, the mudras. So, Gesha says, I hope uh, soon, before long, we have an opportunity to have a session on uh, demonstrating the mudras. So. That was a short explanation for today's class. Gesha says there are some things that I do not know. Perhaps there are some things that uh, got mixed up and so forth. If you have the opportunity, do check with other lamas and other teachers. Um, I, if there is a mistake, please correct the mistake. If I have said something wrong, please do it rightly. Get it correct and do it as it should be. If there was no mistake, very good. <laughs> that would be very even better. Um, so yes, so this was the presentation and let's have the dedication.